There were many there were many important events that happened between 1858. The five most important ones are the Louisiana Purchase, Missouri Compromise, the Fugitive Slave Law, Make sure you look up a little the Great bit. Compromise, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act. In 1803, the Louisiana Purchase gave America the chance to expand in size. When America expanded in size, the problem of slave states and free states arose. The Missouri Compromise was a bill adopted by the Congress in 1820. It was a compromise to hold off tensions between the North and the South. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 made it illegal to house an escaped slave <coughs> and also forced slaves to be returned to their owner even if they were in a free state. The Great Compromise in 1850 was a way of holding back the increasing tensions over slavery and its expansion into the new U.S. territories. On May 30th, 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed. The Kansas-Nebraska Act made it so that the new states of Kansas and Nebraska could vote if they wanted to have slavery in on. This caused a large immigration of both pro- and anti-slavery supporters. This thought of slavery was always, always morally wrong to Lincoln. He didn't think that anyone is worthy of being treated that horribly. Just seeing those poor people chained ruthlessly together made him feel awful. And I'm sure, wait, no. Lots of people, including Lincoln, have always had a moral problem with slavery. Lincoln once wrote a letter to his friend Speed about his opinion on slavery. It read, you may remember, as well as I do, that from Louis Louisville to the mouth of the Ohio, there were on board 10 or Move your thing slaves. down. Shackled with irons. The slave was a continual <laughs> torment to me, and I see something like it every time I touch the Ohio, Ohio or any other slave border. It is hardly fair for you to assume that I have no interest in a thing which has and continually exercises the power of making me miserable. You ought to rather appreciate how much the great body of the northern people do crucify their feelings. In order to maintain their loyalty to the Constitution of the Union, I do oppose the extension of slavery, because my judgment and feelings so prompt me. I am under no obligation to the contrary. If this, if for you, if for this you and I must differ, differ we must. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. That is an excerpt from a speech made in Springfield, Illinois. Slavery was a strong division that could not be solved easily. Lincoln felt very strong about this. Hello, I'm Emily Samuelson, and today I'm here to inform you about the seven debates about to occur over the next few months between Abraham Lincoln and Senator Stephen A. Douglas. The debates will be held in each Illinois congregational district. Before we begin, let's learn a little bit about Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln first entered politics in 1846 when he was elected for the U.S. House of Representatives. However, after he failed to win re-election, Lincoln took a break from the political field until recently when the Republican Party elected him to run against Stephen Douglas for the political position of Illinois Senator. He accepted this role with the now famous words, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave, half free. Douglas's opening speech at Ottawa called attention to the resolutions passed by the Illinois State Republican Convention. Douglas quoted the Republican resolutions calling for the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law the prohibition of the admission of new slave states, the exclusion of slavery from all territories, and the prohibition of slavery in Washington, D.C. He continued this by stating, You cannot get Mr. Lincoln, your candidate, to come out and say that he is now for each one of them, that these propositions do one and all constitute the platform of the Black Republican Party this day. I have no doubt, and yet my object is 
in reading them is to put the question to Abraham Lincoln this day, whether he now stands and will stand by each article that creed and carry them out. If all earthly power were given to me, I should not know what to do as to the existing institution. My first impulse would be to free all the slaves and send them back to Liberia, to their own native land. But a moment's reflection would convince me that whatever of high hope there may be in this, in the long run, it is sudden, its sudden execution is impossible. I have no disposition to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. This is, there is a physical difference between the two, which in my judgment will probably forever forbid they're living together on terms of respect, social, and political equality. In regard to the Fugitive Slave Law, I have never hesitated to say that I think, under the Constitution of the United States, the people of the Southern States are entitled to a Congregational Fugitive Slave Law. I have always said that. I have nothing to say in regard to the existing slave law further than this. I am glad, at last that I have brought Mr. Lincoln to the conclusion that he had better define his position on certain political topics which I call to his attention at Ottawa. Hello and welcome to the News Channel 87, and today we were able to get a hold of Abraham Lincoln, who has just finished his Cooper Union speech. Hello, Mr. Lincoln. How are you? Hello. I'm great. Thanks for asking. I'm fighting against the expansion of slavery. Do you think slaves should have the same rights as whites? No. Are you thinking about running for president or anything like that? Yes. Is it true that you said wrong as we think slavery is, we can't afford to let it alone? Yes. So what do you mean by that? Slavery is an issue in our nation that we cannot leave unnoted. Something must be done about it. And what will you do about it? I will stop the expansion of it, or at least try. And many people will support this? Yes. Why? Because it is a major issue and it needs to be stopped. Is preventing slavery your only goal? No, I want to keep the union as well. Is it also true that you said let's be diverted by none of these other issues? Yes. And what do you mean by this? We should not be distracted by the issue at hand. When did you agree to write the speech? October 1859. Did anyone help you write the speech, or did you do it by yourself? Actually, William Herndon helped me. Anyone important at the speech? Horace Greeley and William Bryant were both there. Are they important? They opposed William Stewart for president. So the people with power? Yes. So they're going to help you get elected for president? Yes. What was the point of the speech? This speech was a political speech. However, it was originally supposed to be a lecture, but my sponsors and I decided to make it a political speech for president. Do you have any final words for your fellow Americans? Vote for who you think would run this country correctly. Thank you for joining me today, and have a great day. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is Abraham Lincoln reporting to you dead.
My life began on February 12, 1809, and ended on April 15, 1865. I was assassinated by jo actor John Wilkes Booth while I was watching a play. I am now known as one of the most remembered presidents for one thing. I was the one who decided that slavery was not the path that our country should take and that we should stay together as a country. My opinion was that, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. During the Civil War, it was clear to me that something about the way our country functioned was needed to be changed. I then released the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed all of the slaves in the rebellion states. This angered the majority of the slave states that had tried to secede from the United Nations. It was not until January 1, 1863, that all the slaves in America were finally freed. However, this did not save them from oppression. Then on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or de designated part of the state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then therein forward forever free, in the executive branch of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do not act or act to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts that they make for their actual freedom. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue of the power in me vested as Commander-in-Chief, of the Army and Navy of the United States in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are, and henceforward shall be free. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to obtain from all violence, unless in necessary self-defense, and I recommend to them that in all cases, when allowed, they labor faithfully or reasonably wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable conditions will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind as the gracious favor of Almighty God. Hello, and please welcome Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. More than 40,000 have died here today, and we are here to dedicate the fallen who have fought here in Gettysburg. I'm not going to talk about slavery, but I will talk about us staying together as one nation, a nation of liberty. Our nation is in, a, is in, the, middle war, is in the middle of a civil war that is tearing this country apart. Our state in this war can increase if we secure our position. We as the Union have given support to Kentucky, Virginia, and other Union slave states for them to help us create a new birth of freedom. To keep us pushing strong in the fight, we must not stop here. We shall prevail onto a better future for this great nation. We have to bring word to the Declaration into reality in our great nation. This nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, and shall not perish for the earth, from the earth. Now we will bow our heads in a prayer. Go forth, Christian soul, from this world, in the name of God, the Almighty Father, who created you, in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who suffered for you. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who was poured out upon you, go forth, faithful Christian.
Good morning, I'm Elizabeth Tarazi, and you just tuned into our new segment, Former United States Presidents. Today, we are talking about our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. We are talking about Lincoln's second inaugural address that he gave in 1865. What? What was that? We just received rare footage of Lincoln giving his second inaugural address. Let's hear. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it, that's great. If you didn't catch that, in simpler terms, Lincoln is saying that in 1861, both the North and the South dreaded the Civil War and wanted to avoid it. It's the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that men w should dare ask God assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of another man's faces, but let us judge not we, that we not be judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been fully answered. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs to be offenses come, but woe to the man whom, by whom the offense cometh. We just heard a very important part of this speech. It talked about how both the North and the South Pray to the same God, but their prayers of winning the war would not both be answered. This speech is very important because Lincoln desired a lasting peace between the North and the South and a smooth transition back to the Union. Now let's welcome Ava, who will tell us a little bit about the difference between the first and second inaugural address. Welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth. There is a big difference between Lincoln's first inaugural address and his second inaugural address. In his first inaugural address in 1681, Lincoln says, and I quote, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it already exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and so I have no inclination to do so. And while a month after his second inaugural address, um, Congress passes the 13th Amendment, which abolishes all slavery. Thank you, Ava. Now that wraps up our segment on Lincoln. Tune in next week for our number one president, George Washington. Good night, America.